Well, good morning, everybody. This is Dr. Alan Childs, pastor of the Bible Church, Pipe Creek, Texas, coming to you this Friday morning around 6, 6 a.m. Uh, September 9th. And I hope all of you are doing well today and living happily in the joy of the Lord this morning. I'm going to be sharing with you uh, actually quite a bit of disclosure this morning of some things that um, we don't normally address in our church services and our teaching and preaching because we're going to be stepping out into some scientific related information here and experiences, uh, sharing some things with you that are biblical, and I'm going to use some scriptures that uh, take us into a place that uh, most would consider to be on a theoretical level, but we're going to, I'm going to show you they're actually spiritually very practical. I'm going to title this conversation we're having this morning, the spiritual springboard. And I'm going to use a parable example, if you'll allow that I do that. Jesus often used parables to help people understand things that uh, was outside their knowledge experience uh, to be able to assimilate in a way that they could make sense of it. So I'm going to do that today. Because I realize that we don't all have the same level of experiences in our follow-up to the new birth experience, which those of you who have followed my biblical uh, lectures, etc., know that I believe that we must start out with that experience in order to comprehend anything about the kingdom of God or to be able to envision, see, or participate in the kingdom of God. We must be born again. Uh, Jesus told Nicodemus that in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 3. Check it out for yourselves. I'm going to go to uh, a little bit of, uh, let's, let's look first in uh, Paul's teaching to the Corinthians. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, we'll go over to chapter 15. Let me bring you up to speed at what Paul is doing here. Paul had started out uh, back a little bit here in the previous chapter uh, talking about uh, the context of charity, the importance of charity, uh, a godly type of love that, that would operate within us in the church and as individuals. So Paul didn't take things out of priority where we're going today. He's moving on in subject. Paul transitions in his style of systematic exposition in his writing, and he will cover a lot of territory in his discourse of lecture. And here with the Corinthians, he's going over from the subject of charity preceding in the chapters before chapter 15, and he's going to be uh, moving from that priority position over into the subject of the rev, uh, resurrection, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. But Paul makes a few, a few statements that gives us a window into his experience a little bit. Paul's experience in the Lord uh, is revealed in some of the statements he makes here. I'm going to go uh, just read a little bit here. Uh, Chapter 15, 1 Corinthians. Let's just, and remember, the context is actually about the resurrection power and, and, and the subject of re resurrection. Let's look at verse 38, and we'll begin reading a little bit here, and I'm going to explain some things to you. Reading in the King James, start at verse 38. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beast, another of fishes, 
and other of birds, but Paul showing and recognizing the differences of the design mechanisms of biological creatures, including man here, being different one from another. But notice what he says here in verse 40. Be very cautious in your analysis here. It says, there are also celestial bodies. Now, he just talked about bodies of things we're familiar with that we see in the course of our everyday lives. Now he's moving on. He says, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. Now, notice the difference there. He talked about the terrestrial bodies and differences in the verse preceding. But now he's talking about celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Recognizing a, a difference there. Now, there are differences of the... And notice he's still in the context of flesh here. So the terrestrial things that he described operate within a fleshly mechanism. In other words, a physical three-dimensional uh, three body operating in the four dimensions that we operate here in the terrestrial. But then he mentioned that there are celestial bodies also. Now, bodies being plural, representing, as he talked about in the terrestrial, he didn't get into detail because he knows most people don't go around identifying visually the celestial bodies by, by description. The differences such as birds, fishes, man, things like that. In other words, uh, you've got to see something to identify the difference. Now notice I said earlier, unless we're born again of the Spirit, uh, we, we cannot comprehend uh, extra-dimensional, interdimensional, uh, and even comprehend intra-dimensional uh, actions uh, and, and experiences. Now Paul uh, had experienced these things. He talked about earlier there how that he uh, knew some man some 14 years ago there in his writing preceding this uh, whether in the body or out of the body he could not say in other words uh, you know for whatever reason he didn't want to put himself on the spot in making that determination now I'll explain a little bit about that we are discovering today scientifically uh, and, and I, I like science I appreciate science I consider myself to be a person of science, also a person of faith, a Christian. And we Christians, who people of faith, that are also people of science, uh, take science in light of examination, uh, considering uh, our Creator, God, whereas the secular scientists don't necessarily always take in that what we consider to be essential uh, comparative within their evaluations and assessments. In any experimentation uh, there are rules. There are structural rules and methods in standard academic science. Well the same applies when it comes to faith. Uh, faith people who operate in faith physics uh, the sciences of dynamics and faith understand that rules apply. Uh, those rules are governed by our creator, the organizer, the architect of all structural matter and, and all creatures. Now, Paul, having mentioned that there are celestial bodies, uh, when, when we think of celestial, we automatically think of uh, outside earth outside the atmosphere but when when we consider the things that we're learning and knowing now in, in the sciences we're understanding a much broader scope of creations as believers and that that broader scope includes uh, dimensional uh, structures that we don't normally associate ourselves with here in the physical body on earth. 
Now, as spiritual born-again creatures, which we are, we're born of flesh here on earth as human beings. We all share that in common. And Paul talked about that there in a verse that these types of fleshly bodies. But when we're born again of the Spirit, we are birthed into a new identity as a spiritual being. Um, and I'm not getting off into uh, New Age philosophy or anything here. Because there's nothing new about that. that That's the way it was designed in, in God. Uh, Adam, when he was made as a biological mechanism there of the finer things of earth, the dust of the earth, uh, the Lord breathed life into Adam's not. The Lord breathed it into Adam. When we are born again of the Spirit, that life is generated, breathed into us by the Spirit. And we are conceived of the Lord. Now, by the power of the Holy Ghost. Remember, it was the power of the Holy Ghost that conceived in Mary that she bare the only begotten Son of the Father in flesh here on earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's because of Him and by Him which we are conceived and birthed into this new identity as a spiritual creature. But, you know, unfortunately, with some folks, it seems to kind of stop there because they don't have the hunger or desire to reach into the spiritual walk uh, and incorporate learning how to walk in the spiritual places. And there are spiritual places there. When we're talking about spiritual places. We're talking about interdimensional structures within God's design. And as spiritual creatures, we can operate in these interdimensional places. That's called walking in the Spirit. Now, I'm not talking about like some New Age guru here experimenting with... Uh, outside God's leading and control. I'm talking about the Bible says God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Part of that truth is knowing and identifying intimately with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by that same spirit. If you want to understand more about that, go to um, the Gospel of John. started about chapter 13 and read through chapter 16, really taking in what's being taught there about the spiritual uh, taking place in our life and leading us, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us in truth. Uh, let me read uh, a couple of uh, three scriptures here that I made note of from the King James Version, starting in Matthew 19 and 26 says this, Jesus speaking. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. All things are possible. How? With God. Mark 9 and 23 says this, If thou canst believe all things are possible, to him that believeth. Believeth. Proceeding forward in faith. Believing that God is able. All things are possible to him that believeth. Not a few things. All things. Mark 10 and 27 says. And Jesus looked upon them and saith. With men it is impossible but not with God, for with God all things are possible. So there are things that definitely are possible with God that would not be possible without God. In other words, just a man operating on his own. So I'm going to talk about that with you a little bit today. Uh, let's call it spiritual physics. Spiritual physics. What is spiritual? 
Spiritual people usually think of something we don't see or identify as a physical body uh, around us, but nevertheless, it's there. Uh, it's interdimensional. It's real. It's there. Uh, just to help you understand spiritual. The Bible is full of such references. The Bible doesn't use terms uh, that we use in modern science today, such as dimensional or dimensions, but to help us understand on a modern level, I'm using the terminology so you'll understand the mechanical applications here dimensionally. Now, all of us learned in school about the basic dimensional qualities and quantities, how they work, how they interreact and, and relate. But what we did not learn is interdimensional relationships because in order to be taught that, it has to be standardized in some form in which it can be academically presented to a class. Well, what I'm going to do here today is I'm going to try to apply from my own experience in explaining some things to you that I have proven theoretically in my own research in my life. And I'll use the word research to explain why I use that here in a moment. Uh, when I was found by the Lord, it's the way I'll say it as a teenager, when I came to the Lord, the Lord had already allowed, I, I'll put it this way, ordained certain things to happen in my childhood that were extraordinary. Um, I had seen things that people aren't supposed to see, according to some. I had witnessed and I had interacted with interdimensional entities as a child. It wasn't voluntary on my part, but it happened. It was very real. It was not imagined. There were physical evidences that substantiate certain experiences as having had been real. Uh, and on re-examination and retrospect, I have again and again uh, learned from certain things of these experiences and found them to be not any sort of imaginary invention or innovation, but actually experienced in the physical interacting with those things which would not normally be recognized as physical in our realm of four-dimensional existence. So let me talk to you a little bit about what I learned. I learned that many were misreading certain information in the Bible in their own understanding of it. Uh, I, I think a lot of this was because of the way it was taught to them by others and it was just accepted as being the version of the view that had to be true because that's what they had been taught about it culturally in their their own background in society um, but certain experiences I had uh, proved within me in my life and my knowledge and established that there were certain things that were real that were really there that were not a fable that weren't a legend but they were fact by experience uh, you know those things in your life happen sometimes that you just wouldn't believe it unless you experienced it. Uh, like the first time you view over the realm of the Grand Canyon and look at that beautiful sight, it's just really hard to take in the, the awe-inspiring comparative emotions when you look upon such a thing with your eyes and experience it. Well, when you experience something, you know it. You know it because you have been through it. It becomes implanted in a part of your identity and your knowledge. Well, when I uh, first came to church uh, as a teenager, the Lord led me to the church. Uh, I had began seeking the Lord uh, I had been witnessed to by some who had received the new birth experience and they were excited about what God had did. And it, it 
really touched a place that awoken a desire in me. Uh, I had this big empty place in my soul that that I just really needed God, and and I I, I sought God both in private in prayer first and then in public in the congregational church environment. And when I went to a revival, I had a hunger for everything that God would do for me. And I knew about the rebirth experience. I knew about the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. And I I knew about needing to be baptized at all. And So I I was so hungry that I, I would go to uh, you know, you can't earn the gift of God, but I did work hard to try to put myself in condition to be ready to receive. Let me put it that way. And perhaps some would think some of the things I did was uh, unnecessary. I did some fasting at the time, which was kind of difficult for me with my schedule. I was a working student in high school and uh, I worked and went to school and uh, fasting. I worked a difficult labor job and uh, it was tough. And I would fast as long as four days with nothing but water. And I'd get these really bad headaches after a couple of days. and I, I really feel the physical impact. But the Lord saw through all of my efforts. I, here I was thinking, oh, I've got to get, I've got to get, to a place where I'm good enough. No, that's not the case. That's not that's not how God operates with us. But I went through all of that, and and it's human uh, to to think that we've got to earn God's attention. But no, we've got His attention. We've just got to get to the place to where we're willing and ready to allow God to do the work that He does with us, not us, and that that we can take part of this wonderful gift that he's already promised us if we just repent and be baptized. Peter told us in Acts 2.38 that these were the instructions for those who, well, what must we do? We're part of that group that promises unto us. Well, that's where we begin. But unfortunately, a lot of folks just stop there. Because of my interdimensional experiences, encounters that I had at an early age. I, I know at one case I saw what some would call an angel bodily in the presence as a man. And because of where he was and what he was doing, he was not an earthly man. And I had saw this at the age of five years old. And I had also witnessed other things that were otherworldly, not of our dimensional possibilities. Having an education and experience in aerospace sciences for decades in my adult life, I understand the state of our science and our technology and engineering. I know what we have and what we don't have. So I was able, even as a young child, to take note and assessments of details and later able to re-examine those details and come to the conclusion that I had witnessed things that mankind didn't make, mankind couldn't make. We don't have the capability scientifically they haven't arrived. We're young as a scientific species. But God allowed me to know these things. God placed that it would happen in my life and protected me and kept me through all these experiences, brought me through, and to allow me to be of service for some good uh, in the kingdom of God and reaching out and testifying of the greatest miracle of all, his power to save our soul by his sacrifice on the cross, which is a very ill will- experience. Receiving the Holy Ghost is the most... Um, Dramatic activity, most dynamic, interdimensional activity you will ever experience. It 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 is truly identity transforming in your life. Thank the Lord for it, and it's for everyone whosoever will. Uh, The Lord doesn't want you to be lost, folks. 
Take advantage of God's promises in your life. He wants us to be intimate with him. He wants us to have what he suffered on the cross to provide for us. All the gifts. God wants you to have them. We must understand that. God wants you to have it. It's not something you got to beg God for. He wants to give it to you. Well, about the spiritual springboard I was talking about. Let me use this parable. We've already seen that all things are possible with God. With God. Very important. Not without God, but with God. Uh, let me use a parable. Uh, we are within... In our physical senses, uh, such as our sight, taste, touch, feel, all these things. Uh, now, I'll say the senses go beyond what we are aware of. Because the synopsis of our central nervous system, synopses, the way the neurons operate and all that, what, what little I really do know, because I've only learned from what others share in research, our minds are able to take in from the outside things that people aren't aware of. Subconscious sensitivity, things like this. Uh, cognate versus subconscious. Uh, and, and, and plus this central nervous system controls every movement of our body, every action that we do, uh, the reflex, the motor activity, everything along with other things. Now, you've heard it said in school and in, in other academic circles that a normal human being only uses a small percentage of their brain mass. Now, I will ask you this. What's it for? What is all this brain mass there for if it's not being utilized and used? It? Now, understand they're making measurements based on what our scientific instruments Medical instruments are able to gauge and measure electrical activity within the brain. So there could be things going on that operate on levels down in there that, that our scientific medical instruments are not able to detect. I will make note of that. I know that I have had interdimensional experiences to where that it was very possible that there was utilized, utilized areas of the brain that become active because of some outside influence or outside trigger that caused it. What would be possible if we could utilize all of our brain mass? We don't know how much would be possible. We don't know what kind of powers would exhibit themselves Intellectually and ability-wise, possibly see into dimensions even. Uh, they could open up things our optic nerves don't reveal in the normal operations of our brain, neuron, and that synopsis. So, you know, there's a lot of things very possible. I know that I could say that with confidence because of some of the experiences that I've had. Now, you don't hear Christian teachers quite often delve into some of these areas. So I'm going to go ahead and dive in on a couple. Since the time that I received the gift of the Holy Ghost in my life, and I was hungry to explore things in my relationship with the Lord. How, you say? Well, in a normal science laboratory, you, you set yourself in an environment to be able to play with things in order to observe and to make assessments. Well, I would place myself in God's natural laboratory, and I would go out and uh, find a place to get alone and talk to God and ask God for things. I ask God to, to do some things. And some, some say, well, you're tempting God in faith doing that. No. I really, it pleases the Lord for us to be curious about him and to reach out intimately to get closer like if you have a son or a grandson that wants to know something you want to share you want to help them understand with every tool you have and remember we read to you from the bible here it says all things are possible with god them that believeth 
Well, the evidence and substance of my faith was visible in the fact that I would make myself available to the Lord by creating an environment to where that I was not distracted, to where I was focused. And I would ask the Lord for some specific things. Um, I'll give you an example of one uh, factual event. I was lying on my back uh, by myself out in a cow pasture uh, looking up at the night sky and I asked the Lord this very specific question just talking to him like you and I are talking right now and I said Lord if there's anything there to be seen the Lord knew what I meant let me see it and immediately the Lord calls something that was not visible to appear physically in the sky there. And I watched it. I watched its actions. I saw what it did, and then it vanished. In other words, the Lord gave me a glimpse. Why? Because I ask. I ask believing. I ask conditionally. I said, Lord, if there's anything there to be seen, let me see it. I didn't say, let's let me see something. I, I said, if there's something there to be seen, let me see it. There's examples of that in the Bible. It's not unbiblical. There's times when the Lord had to open the eyes of his prophets that they would be able to see things they otherwise could not see in the Bible. Go into the Old Testament and all. You'll find it. Paul had seen some things or else he wouldn't have knew. The Lord had allowed Paul to have an experience and knowledge so that he could tell us such things as what he told us there. When he said there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. Terrestrial means terra firma down here on earth. He's making a differentiation. Now, when it comes to certain subjects, we have to contain our zeal sometimes not to get too far out into what is considered in the culture to be controversial because by getting into controversial subjects as a habit we can cause a publicity reproach against our ministry now in our service ministry to the world we're about the gospel. We're about Christ's message to the world, to be saved. It's the ultimate transition. The ultimate transition that teleports us from the cross.